We moved down to Altona in 1939, just at the start of the Second World War when I was a kid. And I remember it was like a real country town. Everyone would meet on a Saturday morning in Pier Street for a chat. And at Lily Malone's Bakeries, you could get a pie and two cakes for sixpence. That was always a treat. I reckon there would only have been about 500 people living down here. And you know, during the war in Pier Street, there used to be an air raid shelter right where the bank used to be. I only really went to school if I had to. Instead, a heap of us kids and dogs used to go to the reserve rabbiting. If we could get out, we'd go camping overnight, take the dogs. That always catches a rabbit we could skin and cook over an open fire. The explosive reserve was operational then. And you know, if you look closely at that big metal fence around the reserve, it's still got its camouflage paint on it that was put on during the war. It lasted all those years. The graffiti comes and goes, but that paint, it's still there. We weren't scared living near the reserve during the war because it was never used to store ammunition. It was a reserve for commercial explosives like gel ignite, which was the olden day version of dynamite. Explosives were made in Deer Park and then stored on the reserve until it was time for them to be used for quarrying. But you know that stuff, it's not always very stable, so when it come to handling it, you had to take great care. I mean, it's okay when it's fresh, you can handle it, as long as you don't have the detonator on you. But when it gets a little bit older, it starts to go to jelly, and that's when it becomes dangerous. Semi-trailers from Nobles used to bring it down from Deer Park where it was made. They used to take all the cobblestone back roads starting at Fitzgerald Road, travelling through tunnels that had been built under Geelong Road until they got to the gates of the reserve. That way, if there was an accident, it wouldn't affect the main roads where people would be more likely to get injured. There were no motors allowed on the reserve either. There wasn't even electricity on some parts, so carriages pulled by Clydesdales were used to transport the explosives down hand-built tram tracks around the site and then they were hand stacked into the bunkers or magazines. Around each hut, earth was stacked as tall as the magazine itself so that if one went up, the rest would be protected. Walking into the estate is like nothing you'd ever see today. I mean, with no trucks, there was no hurry. Just these big old workhorses trundling around, pulling the dray, and decent hard-working men earning a living using their hands and bodies from sun up till the end of day. When it was required that the explosives be sent overseas, they'd then take the explosives again in horse-drawn carriages along the tracks down the jetty to the end of the pier, where again they were hand-stacked by casual stevedores into the lighters. The lighters were engineless boats that were towed to the jetty by tugs. A ship would wait for a lighter out at sea and then everything would be restacked into the boat and the lighter towed back to Williamstown where they were moored until needed again. You might think it all sounds ridiculous to go to that much precaution, but you know, this reserve was the only one worldwide, as far as I know, where there was never an explosion. I started working there when I was 20. I was just a knockabout kid until then, using my truck for odd jobs, but I started on the reserve working as part of the maintenance crew. I'd ride my push bike down from my house in Pier Street, and that place is still standing, you know, it's the one next to Mitre 10. I just walked into the job, really, I had a couple of mates working over there, so I went across one day and said, you know, like, have you got a job for me? And they said, yeah, if you want to work, well, you come and work. But I'll tell you now, I've never been out of work in my life. I'm 67, and I'm still working. I've cut it back a bit, though. I only do about 50 hours a week now. So you could say I'm semi-retired. There was always plenty to do, which you might find surprising. We did all the painting that had to be done on site, fence repairs, clearing of storm damage. There was always work needing to be done on the rail line. I remember you'd have to go in and scrape all of the snakes out of the way so that you could get in and rip out all of the sleepers and put a few new ones in. The rail lines, they'd often need tightening up in parts. Even extended the pier, putting a loop track on it so that you could have more than one Clydesdale delivering explosives on the pier at any time. But you had to do all the jobs by hand. We did it the old way, the way you do things when you live in the bush. I reckon that's why some of it's still standing today, just like the way we built it. I cleared about £12, 10 shilling a week back then. That's about $25 in the new currency. I was a married man, I had three young children before I turned 22. So that money, that's what got us by. 
but it wasn't a fortune. And with all those kids, well, I had to move on. But it was 1956, the Olympics were on in Melbourne, so I got myself a brand spanking new FJ Holden and started taxiing around town. Can you imagine coming from the reserve? No engines, no pressure, not even any roads to speak of. When I remember it, it's as if everything is like a black and white postcard from the past. And the next minute, there I was, ending up in the city. All that hustle and bustle, everyone in a hurry, all the excitement of the games, cruising around in the latest model automobile, 